right, so with no further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, tonight's uh, guest, uh, Richard Garfield, and, and um, it's a really, uh, I'm very excited. It's an honor to have him come uh, here and speak. Um, you know, sometimes I talk about how, even though video games are, are you know, uh, are exploding and it's an enormously large field and we're doing, uh, you know, tremendously interesting and important work, um, sometimes I think the ambitions of modern day game designers are kind of small. Um, smaller than they should be, because I, I, I seldom see people who, who are thinking about making games on the scale of something like baseball, right? Um, we, you know, we're, we're making these games now which are more like, they're more like movies or, or books, they're things that you consume, and, and, um, but you know, who out there is thinking big on the scale of something like that? Um, and I kind of think um, our guest tonight is a person who has done something like that, right? I think. Uh, in, in Magic the Gathering uh, is a game of that scope and, and grandeur. You know, it's the kind of game uh, that baseball is. It's not just uh, a piece of, uh, uh, of culture that, that you, you consume, uh, and it, you know, it's, 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 it's a way of life. It has the potential for many people to be uh, a career, uh, you know, something you can devote your life to. And, um, and that's amazing. There just, there aren't many games like that in the world, um, and so, you know, to, to have made something uh, like that, to have produced something like that, is uh, is is truly spectacular. Um, Richard is uh, is is a was a mathematician, um, and then he became a game designer. He you know, with Magic: The Gathering, uh, created not just this uh, important game, but really uh, pioneered a new genre, an entire industry. Um, you know that that is currently uh, you know an important uh, uh, industry and. Um, in addition to, to Magic the Gathering, uh, he, you know, he's worked on other games, um, uh, games that uh, like Netrunner and, and Great Dal Moody, uh, board games like uh, Robo Rally. Uh, he's he's uh, worked as a game designer on, on video games like uh, Spectromancer. Um, so he's done a lot of, of really uh, interesting work and continues to do interesting work. Um, he also has a terrific podcast so if you're not familiar with this, you should definitely uh, be subscribing to Games with Garfield, which is, I think, maybe the best uh, game podcast uh, out there, um, and uh, in, in addition to Another Castle. The second, they're, they're, they're both favorites. Another Castle is good, they're, they're both favorites. Um, <laughs> and, um, and he also has, uh, he's also uh, uh, has a book that is coming out uh, in, I think, the fall, which I'm very excited about, which is called Characteristics of Games. Uh, and he's with us tonight, so please put your hands together for Richard Garfield. Well, thank you. Uh, so this, uh, I, was, I was told this is a, a, a little, do a presentation and then have a little dialogue. Uh, my presentation, uh, I may go kind of fast through it, because to get to the dialogue, but if you interrupt in the middle, then we can have a little dialogue inside. Uh, my talk today is on luck and games. The material uh, is from, uh, I've, I've wrote some articles on luck, and, uh, and then I've given this talk, and, and also in characteristics of games, we break down, uh, we, we look at individual characteristics of games, and, and we, uh, each chapter is devoted to one of them, and, and so luck is one of those. So. Um, right before I start, I want to mention that, that when I talk about games here, I'm going to talk about ortho games, uh, and that's a, a word I coined, so I don't expect you to know it. Um, uh, um, anybody who's tried to actually define games uh, has failed, uh, and Wittgenstein has uh, proved that. Uh, and uh, but 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 you, it's it's really difficult to talk to uh, talk about games, all games. Uh, so what I do is I break off uh, this small. Uh, portion of games, which uh, uh, which are finite multiplayer games that result in players being ranked, okay, and that's not all games. But what I talk about is relevant often to the games which aren't ortho games. You just have to. Uh, so the reason I mention this is because when I'm going to talk casually about uh, uh, somebody's chances of winning or losing, uh, obviously that doesn't apply to all games. So uh, uh, I'm implicitly talking about ortho games. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is luck versus skill. Okay, and and uh, this is a, a false. This is a false dichotomy. 
uh, with, with uh, uh, you can have games with a lot of luck and a lot of skill, or games with not much of either. So <clears throat> one thing I like to do is create toy games. Uh, toy games are games which you don't actually play, you just use them to illustrate points, uh, uh, or, or, or understand how games work. So uh, the first toy game of this talk is rando chess, uh, which is you play, you play standard chess, but afterwards you roll a die, and if you uh, roll a one, the winner loses and the loser wins. <laughs> okay, so rando chess, uh, and here uh, throughout this talk, we don't have time to uh, really go into precision of what I mean by luck and skill. I'll be appealing to sort of an intuitive sense. Uh, it definitely has more luck. Nobody's going to argue that. And under most intuitive understandings of what skill is, it's got just as much skill in the sense that Anything you know about chess applies to rando chess. Uh, uh, there's just as much scope for mastery. And in fact, uh, if people took rando chess seriously, uh, they would end up with the same rankings as regular chess. It would just take a little longer. Okay. Uh, another uh, game is pick a number. In pick a number, uh, each player simultaneously exposes a number of uh, fingers. Whoever shows more fingers wins. Okay. <laughs> So this is a low luck game, uh, and there's not much skill. Okay, so this is a game which is low in both those categories. Uh, once players know, have the skill, it'll always be a draw, unless you have more fingers. <clears throat> so, so what we end up with is a uh, is a is a graph like this, where where you can have games with low luck and low skill, which I put tic tac toe at, uh, high luck. Uh, low skill, bingo, no skill. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, poker, <laughs> poker has high skill and high luck, and, and Go is not so big in the luck department. So now we're going to talk about what luck is. I should say the first half of this talk is pretty is 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 pretty academic in the sense that it's not explicitly about what this has to do with games. It's just. How, uh, how I think about games. And uh, um, in the second half, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more about what the role of luck in games is. So where does luck come from in a game? It comes, uh, it comes from a lot of different places. Uh, uh, so there's overt randomness. Uh, you've got dice, cards, and uh, random numbers. Uh, nobody would argue that, that these will generate luck within a game. Um, a little... Uh, a little more, uh, oh, my font didn't work. Um, a, a little more, uh, uh, a little harder to get your head around is, is uh, uh, game theory luck. When you play rock, paper, scissors, uh, uh, there's a, some people, uh, there's a tendency, especially uh, when you first play the game, to think it's all skill because, uh, because uh, there's, there's, there's no overt luck. There's no dice rolling. You're making your choices. You're guessing what the other person is doing. But uh, when you study game theory, of course, uh, there's uh, what you uh, oftentimes what you want to do is introduce luck. So you try to move randomly, and and so then the question becomes philosophical: Can somebody actually move randomly? Well, they, it's it's very difficult for them to move actually randomly, as in with an even probability or whatever probability they're looking at. But in the sense of not being predictable, they can do that, or being not 100% predictable. Uh, it's just as, another way to think about it is, is we, we accept a die as being random, but technically you can track it with physics. It's the same thing. Can you track a human mind with them trying to fool you? And it's pretty chaotic. It's hard to do. Uh, Similarly, politics uh, ends up being uh, uh, something which introduces introduces uh, luck, uh, and that's and I'm not talking. Uh, so when other people are in the game, when there's groups of other people, the coalitions can go any way, in unpredictable ways, uh, and and that uh, simply can beyond can be beyond your prediction and beyond your total control. You may have some control over it, but you don't have total control. So then another place you'll find luck is with uh, physical limitations. So uh, memory, uh, for example, if you play concentration, you've had this experience, almost certainly, where you got to find the queen, and 
you can remember it's one of those two cards, but you don't know which one. So you flip one up, and uh, and sometimes you got it, sometimes you haven't. You failed sometimes, you've succeeded sometimes. You're technically it shouldn't be a matter of luck because you know where it is, but your memory has failed you. It's a 50-50, or maybe maybe you've got a 20% chance. Uh, who knows? But uh, there's some luck in that, even though in some sense it's deterministic. Similarly with accuracy, uh, uh, one of the places you'll see with accurate, a luck and accuracy would be something like shooting baskets or, or in baseball. Uh, uh, there's a lot of studies which are done about uh, whether these can be modeled just probabilistically. And, and al al almost, almost totally that can be, th that, that's the case. For example, uh, a study you, you've probably heard of is, is, is whether uh, hot streaks exist or not. People feel like they've got hot streaks, uh, uh, but, but the thing is that, that, uh, they, that those streaks fit into the expected mathematical uh, expectation. And so we, uh, we as humans look for order in chaos, and we find it as in, in, the, in, in the sense of a hot streak, but it's still just chaos. Now again, this doesn't mean that there's no skill. It's not. They're not. Uh, I, I don't want to treat those things as opposites. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, some people can be better at others at shooting baskets, but it's not a uh, hundred percent better. It's 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 a matter of whether they. When, when you get better at shooting a basket, it, you're increasing your probability. You're still rolling the dice, though. Similarly, uh, your speed and your uh, strength. Uh, Strength uh, 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 felt weird putting up there, but I've got a friend who's a, a power lifter, and uh, and he tells me the variation in what he can pick up any particular uh, competition is is very large. And what is it from? Is it from that he grabbed it wrong? From uh, his training the previous week? From his diet? He doesn't know, right? And so, what are you going to attribute it to? So this brings us to complexity. If you have to choose between two doors, and one of them uh, has success, and one of them has failure. Well, that's luck. So what if these are uh, just complexity beyond your understanding or anybody's understanding? Okay, If you make a move in chess and you don't understand all the implications, well, you're facing a decision which amounts to luck. Uh, your heuristics may, the heuristics you've applied to the game may, 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 may force you to choose one, may allow you to choose one, and maybe you, there you've got a 70% chance of winning, but you're still rolling the dice unless you can see all the way to the end of that very complicated tree, which not many people can. Uh, toy game number three, um, guess a digit of pi. So uh, the two players are given a large number and they're told they've got 30 seconds to guess what digit that is of pi. What, what the, did, what the 50, 000, 50, 347,200th digit of pi is. They both make a guess. Oh, one of them won. <laughs> hey, now, you can see what this illustrates. This game is deterministic. There's, by using a naive sense of luck, there is no luck in this game. But in practice, uh, it's it's going to be uh, it's, you're going to have a one in ten chance of winning, and just like luck in uh, in, a, in a game of complexity like Go or chess, you you can improve your chances by memorizing lots of digits of pi, <laughs> or or perhaps more realistically by by coming up with theories about distribution. Like you might be able to, you might observe that uh, that there's less zeros in regions of pi or something like that, and then you don't guess zero and you've you've upped your chances a little bit. Uh, um, so, so here it's a game which is apparently deterministic, but you can clearly see there's going to be luck in practice. I could beat Kasparov if I be, if I played randomly, <laughs> assuming he can be beaten, which I think. Either. And and I've actually uh, done this calculation. I think that uh, I have a better chance of winning the New York State Lottery 15 times in a row. But I have a chance. So that, that leads to me the way I think about luck, which is uncertainty in outcome. Okay, if you can't, uh, if you if you don't know how it's going to come out, then I consider that a matter of luck. Um, and and this has some people don't like this definition because it means that any game which is worth playing has some luck in it. Uh, and what's the point of making a definition where? Uh, where it's everywhere. I mean, tic-tac-toe against with two skilled players doesn't, 
but beyond that, you know, there's always luck. Um, and, but, but games always have a duration, too, and, uh, and they always have a number of players. And, and what that duration is and what those numbers of players are do have impacts on the design. Similarly here, what those chances are for different player groups matters. And uh, it shouldn't surprise us that any time we try to pin down what luck is that we're going to be uh, run into some counterintuitive situations. Uh, um, humans are, they look for order, they don't, uh, and they try to explain, they look for order in chaos, they try to explain it. So, uh, apologize for my uh, sloppy graphics there. Um, uh, so, an, an, an exercise which is often used to illustrate that is you ask somebody to fake uh, 100 coin tosses and then gen generate 100 coin tosses. You can almost always uh, tell which is which. The top one is fake. Uh, you can see fake underneath my uh, under, underneath there. Um, I gave this test to my son. He failed. <laughs> <laughs> and I gave it to my daughter. So, funny thing about my daughter: uh, when she was four, uh, I was trying to play all my games with her, and, and I was able to play uh, a lot of different games with her, concentration, dice games, and so forth, but the games which I was having the most difficulty were the ones where you bluff. Uh, so I created a game which trained her to bluff. Okay? It was, uh, we called it the lying game, and she hid a coin in her hand, and then she would uh, tell me which it was, and she could lie. And she lost all the time until she started to win, and then she won a lot. And uh, and like now when we play werewolf, I, I I try to analyze everybody else. I don't try to analyze her. So she's kind of like Hit Girl from Kickass when it comes to games. <laughs> and she passed. Right, so so how should we use luck? Okay, this is a more uh, uh, utilitarian part of the presentation. Um, uh, in history, games, well, there weren't professional designers. There's pressure, the, the designs would come from the community. Uh, sometimes uh, it would be the elite in the community. Sometimes it would be uh, uh, the casual uh, groups. This is largely guesswork uh, because there's not too much, uh, like tracking, tracking the genealogy of games is, is difficult. Uh, but, but it's clear that sometimes uh, Luck is removed is ad, is removed from games. Uh, chess came from Chaturanga. Used to have dice. Um, uh, doubling cube uh, increases the uh, decreases the uh, the variance in uh, in uh, backgammon a lot. Um, bridge uh, moved from rubber bridge to duplicate bridge, and uh, there's a lot of different modes of bridge that that and and, and uh, that that increase the what, what, what the experts are trying to do in these cases, and, and magic has had uh, less and less luck over the years, what they're trying to do in these cases, there, if there's a serious game community, they're trying to determine who's the best. And uh, to do that, they begin reducing the noise which is introduced by luck. Okay? Not all games uh, reduce in luck, otherwise we wouldn't have any uh, new games, like a, a Monopoly, for example, um, the house rule uh, with free parking I increases the amount of luck in the game. Um, but if there's a serious play group, that's a strong tendency. Once you have luck in a game, it's really hard to, uh, it's really hard to remove it. Because the mature play group doesn't like uh, the trivialization of their expertise. They want to win all the time. So, I've uh, uh, present. I've, I've got three th three different strengths of luck, reasons why you might want more luck in a game. Uh, so, luck can increase the variety uh, of play experience. Uh, this is because in a deter in a more deterministic game, when you make the same set of moves, you'll often end up in in the same or very similar positions. Uh, with if if there's luck introduced to this, you can end up in 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 more novel positions, and then you have to learn how to deal with those. Uh, like that's a pretty unusual position. So. 
Um, the, the variety in particular can a, a p appeal to the innovator. Um, I, I like to divide uh, players into, you know, I've got uh, a bunch of different personalities. Two of them are uh, innovators and honers. The innovators like to play new games and they like the early days of the game where they're learning the making up big strategy leaps. The honers like to perfect those. And obviously there's some overlap. Some people take pleasure in both, but usually, uh, but oftentimes people uh, identify with one or the other more. So a uh, higher luck game is more likely to satisfy the innovator for longer because they are, there are more novel situations that are being introduced to the game. Uh, randomness can also be used in setting up the game which uh, effectively increases the luck in the game and increases the variety of uh, play states. Um, so to think of how that might be ap applied to a, a computer game, in a real-time strategy game, suppose you had, um, suppose you had uh, a randomized price schedule or technologies for, uh, for the game. Uh, in a traditional real-time strategy game, if the community thinks that, that the tank is the best unit, well, it doesn't really matter if the tank is the best unit, you're going to see a lot of tanks. Okay, it's uh, really actually kind of irrelevant whether, whether or not it's designed correctly, it's what the community plays. Uh, and this game starts to get kind of boring. But if you have randomized prices, occasionally the, the community will have to concede the dragon is better and that'll kick people out of that rut and, uh, and uh, and uh, may increase the amount of variety you see in this otherwise potentially stagnated game. Um, one thing that uh, that always amazes me is that uh, is that uh, randomized chess was uh, considered seriously by Bobby Fischer, and the reason why that's that's sort of amazing is because you you seldom see people who are so entrenched in in the in the uh, elite of a game advocate adding something which increases the luck. Uh, I mean, if anybody was going to do it for, for chess, it would be Fisher. Uh, but but uh, um, as somebody at the top would sell, you wouldn't expect somebody at the top of, for instance, magic to, uh, to advocate a, a much more, uh, a, a, a something which would uh, decrease the chance for them to, to shine. Um, I suppose this actually increased Fisher's chance to shine relative to the others, but. Uh, Okay, so this brings me to the second uh, thing which you might use luck for. Luck can protect egos uh, because losing can be painful. You don't like to think of yourself as too slow, too weak, too stupid. <laughs> um, ideally, uh, players will think they did well by their own actions but uh, did poorly due to bad luck until they become mature. And then they can, uh, and then and then their egos can take it. Uh, and the last characteristic of luck, which uh, I want to talk about, which can be useful for games, is is matching. Um, uh, more luck can broaden your audience. So, when people come over to my house, I've got walls and walls of uh, of board and card games, and I have no problem finding games for everybody to play. If we're going to play video games, it's much, much different uh, because, because most video games, they have to be into that video game before they're interested in playing. So with those video games, uh, uh, your opponents are broken off into, into, into people who are uh, too advanced for you and too easy, and it becomes difficult for you to find your match. Now. The computer can mitigate this, and some people will. Uh, uh, this is their solution to that. They want high skill or low luck games, and then the matching is done by computer um, because it can bust through. But <laughs> players often want to choose people based uh, peop the people they play with based on more criteria than just what their skill is. They want to play with their family and friends. So. <laughs> Will my girlfriend play Call of Duty with me? And uh, maybe if I'm lucky. But Mario Kart, Settlers of Catan, Smash Brothers, poker, 
These are games, uh, whether or not she's into that, she can get into it very quickly because there's enough luck in these games that, uh, that, uh, that, that the matching is very easy. It's very broad. Okay? Games with, uh, with low luck, often have, you often have to invest a lot of work into playing with people of disparate skills or disparate investments. So I said often luck decreases over time when you've got uh, the, the uh, serious community driving the design. Um, there is some argument that that should be the case. Um, the mature audience doesn't need the variety that the, the new audience does. When I first started playing hearts, uh, uh, it was the big differences in the hands that mattered. As an expert heart player, hearts player, uh, I don't need to play with wacky variations or anything like that because the subtlety of the hands means something to me now. So similarly, with uh, with uh, uh, with with any game with a, with a lot of with a lot of skill, uh, uh, they can uh, the players can appreciate subtle differences. Uh, and and uh, as mentioned before, they don't need uh, a crutch for their ego as much. And uh, not only that, uh, there's the player base will tend to be of a better skill level. And that's because uh, oftentimes in a game, a little bit of education goes a long way. Like when you're playing your first shooter, that you're, you're, you're not going to have fun, uh, and, and the people playing with you uh, uh, won't have any problem with you. But, uh, but once you've played a little bit, you're a lot better. You're still not going to compete, but, the, but, the, but the, the number of people you can compete with is a lot bigger. Uh, a little bit of education uh, uh, brings you up to an area where, where it starts to get flat. And so the, uh, and, and also just the educational uh, technology that's out there will help. Like uh, people can catch up because uh, uh, the information's out there. When Magic was first released, uh, the play strengths were all over the map. But as people learned how to think about the game, think about the, the, what the value of a card was, what the value of early, early game versus late game was, this filtered all through the society, uh, through the game playing society, and and uh, and and sort of ramped people up, uh, uh, squashing the the differences. But of course, the risk here is that uh, is that you lock out new players. Uh, now maybe they'll be able to take care of that, uh, take advantage of that educational foundations out there, but it can also uh, just keep them out. So I want to finish with uh, uh, a little anecdote about Team Fortress. Um, the, uh, uh, some of the content of this talk uh, was in uh, Computer Game Developers Magazine uh, uh, when, when Team Fortress was being made. And a friend of mine there, uh, Chris Green, who worked uh, with me on, on Magic Online, uh, he read the article and, and decided he wanted to put luck into Team Fortress. He wanted to give that a try. Now, had he asked me, I would have said, well, if you, if you read if you read my article carefully, uh, you would see that, I, that it's really difficult to inject it into an entrenched game. And I would have viewed uh, the fact that it's a shooter, and the shooter community is, is very mature, uh, that they would reject the luck. Um, but he was of the opinion that they're reaching out to a new audience, and it's a new shooter, so, so maybe, maybe they can inject luck and, and, and use these, these powers which I've talked about. And so, so they put in a swingy critical hit system into the game. And for two weeks uh, in playtest, this game was, uh, was, uh, had crits, but the crits weren't being shown to the players. Uh, they would just get lucky and not realize it, and not know what it was from. And uh, he says that the, the, uh, the response that week of, uh, was, was really positive. The people were saying, oh, this game has gotten a lot more fun. I don't know what's going on, but... <laughs> <laughs> but the interface is good, or something. I feel, uh, um, and and then and then they put in the crit announcements, and then the audience then uh, split into two with the entrenched players saying, "Oh, this is terrible. The crits are taking away everything, and uh, and they're too swingy, and, uh, and 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 the more casual players loving it." And so uh, they had these crits. They launched with the crits. They and and for a couple years they've had them. And now they're beginning to ramp back on them. They're uh, decreasing a lot of the weapons crits and making giving players ways to mitigate that. And I asked them uh, recently whether they regarded that as a 
they finally they, they, they regarded it as a failure because they finally relented to the community. And, and he said, no, he thinks that it did just what it was supposed to do. It uh, broadened their community, uh, and now the community is more mature, and they're tighten, tightening it up because that's what they want. And, uh, and, uh, and so that's it. Thank you. Um, awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, attach this to myself and uh, okay so uh, all right is this on is it working Lauren good um, so great so now uh, now is the time uh, on sprockets where uh, <laughs> I get to um, to have a uh, to ask you a couple questions uh, myself and then we're going to open it up to the audience and and uh, get uh, uh, questions from everyone here um, to begin with actually uh, I want to just uh, tell a little story um, uh, because my son learned to read partly from playing Magic the Gathering. And um, <laughs> so it has a, 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 an important part in, in, um, in, in my heart. And um, in fact, when, when he was uh, in school and they, would, they were teaching uh, kids how to read, um, the, the teacher would put words up on the board like um, maybe fun. And James would look at it and he would try to sound it out and be like, Flying, <laughs> and or there like the word it would be late, and he would say li lightning bolt, and <laughs> teachers had no idea what was going on. That's um, really funny. So, um, so that's my that's my Magic the Gathering story, um, and so one of the things I, I so this was a this was a great talk, and and it and it really um, gets at the heart of something that uh, that I think about a lot, which is. Really, the, the the meaning of games, you know, because I, I think of games as as an you know as an important uh, cultural domain. That these things, and I think that's kind of a new way of thinking about games a little bit. Um, that we are now uh, overall starting to understand, uh, starting to to have this general consensus, partly because of of video games. That games are works of culture. That they're not just a form of recreation. Um, a form of just kind of disposable entertainment or just a pastime, um, but they are something a little bit more like music or literature, something that can can speak to us uh, about the the world and about ourselves and about each other. Um, it has you know that they have something to, to say and that they can be expressive and and more or less beautiful. And um, and I think you know as I say that that's. One of the reasons that we're starting to see games more like that is because video games look more like movies. They look more like literature. They have characters in them and, and uh, you know environments and and so they have and they have themes that are more uh, you know uh, directly uh, expressive in the way that a painting is uh, or that a uh, that a book is. That there's the narrative is there is more present and the and the thematic uh, expression is more about representation. So my question, but to me it's like, when I think about the way that games are meaningful, uh, a lot of the stuff that you're talking about here, about uh, understanding what is the difference between luck and skill. Like these are deep, profound ideas, right? That the way the universe is put together, the, the difference between determinism and randomness, like fate, you know, like whether or not I'm, you know, I have the ability to to, to accomplish the things that I want to. Like that's such a deep, I interesting, important idea. So I guess my, my question is whether you think these two things are, are two separate domains, that, that you have the, these kind of like ortho games or more traditional games or these competitive games in which the meanings are kind of these deeper, richer meanings and they might have a, a relationship to the thematic layer of the game but it's, it's a little bit lighter. And then, and then, you know, video games, single player, like you know, more representational video games. Do you think that these things are are pushing apart, or do you think that they are all part of a big kind of lumpy spectrum? Like that's my question. Yeah, uh, I think <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I I think they're part of a big lumpy spectrum. Okay. Uh, I mean, they're 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 they're. I mean, definitely, computer games are going in ways which which we've never gone before, and uh, um, and uh, but. Uh, and 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 there is some possibility that they are pushing apart, uh, in the sense that uh, that 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 they d they are often 
looking, I mean, looking like they're 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 going into a completely different area, which which we will have difficulty calling just a game. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, but to date, to me, it's it's only been hinted at, and the breadth in games even before uh, computer games has been huge, right? With uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, for example, uh, and, and and the role playing games are so much different than uh, than traditional games, uh, than ortho games, and uh, um, when when you start getting into uh, into uh, in, in, into thinking about that, then uh, I, I don't know if you're going to include those under one umbrella, uh, <laughs> you're going to include a lot of stuff. Do you think that there's a thread that connects all of these things yeah. together? So far, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think I think so. And, and 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 so when I'm talking about locking games, for example, I, I do. I mean, I work on uh, on uh, 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 Facebook games and sing uh, and, and 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 single player games and so forth. And and uh, and not everything about luck impacts that, but but a lot of the things still do, right? Uh, uh, even even if you're not in direct communication with your friends, for example, in a Facebook game. You're in collaboration with them. It's still disheartening to to see them have way more stuff than you, mm -hmm. and uh, and 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 so so thinking about uh, luck in traditional games has some impact there because because what what might help there is if the less invested player has a chance of getting something which the invested player doesn't have. Uh, that that doesn't happen much in Facebook games. If I've played. Ten times as long as you, there's nothing you have which I don't have, um, uh, and 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 so and so I think I think there's some there, there you have to be creative when you start uh, take, taking taking uh, uh, things from ortho games to other domains, but but I think it has some impact. Okay, um, what about the 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 idea now that that what about this transition that you kind of pointed to between uh, the the time in which games kind of emerged organically out of communities and they didn't have uh, the same kind of clear <laughs> authorship, and now where we have you know, a much stronger sense of, of authorship. Do you think that that's a, that's a threshold that we've passed through, or is there still a kind of organic emergent property, or is, it, is the author clear? Or like Yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, I think we're, we're in transition there. Um, and and there's, still, there's still a lot of uh, emergent design from uh, community. Um, but uh, but uh, the the identity of the author is becoming uh, is, 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 is it, it's something new on the scene and, and uh, that's one of the, the reasons why why I think you've got to take something like luck in games and, and really ask yourself what your intuitions are versus what what your responsibility is to whatever your play audience is. Hmm. Um, uh, I mean one thing that's going to help that is. Uh, it, one thing that's going to change that a lot is as players learn a common vocabulary uh, and way of talking about games, that's going to make it, I think, more like film and books and, and writing. When you come out of, uh, when you come into college and you go into film school, uh, you've got you you you've got twelve years of uh, of education about uh, what narrative is and what what the components of it are and. Uh, what you, you you understand things like like the pacing and the, and and, and uh, the characters and and, and uh, um, all sorts of different forms like uh, like poetry and uh, and with games you don't have any formal training there yet it's being introduced now at the top level but uh, but that uh, that foundation there is still grassroots you know what you what you know about games you come in and uh, you come into college and, and you, you you're sort of it's like you've come in and you've, and, and you've only read stories, but you haven't actually, you know, analyzed them or something. Hmm. So when you say the, um, the 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 tension between your intuition as a as a designer and your responsibility to the play community, do you mean the tension? Like, is that another way of getting at my ability to sort of say something with my game, to be expressive, to say, okay, I'm gonna, you know, change this aspect of the game? Because I want to explore this particular idea or express this particular idea, as opposed to like an engineering problem where I oh I need to make the game work. Is well, that, that is that kind of what? Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm thinking of it more of the engineering uh, point okay. of view. Uh, when when uh, as as matters of self-expression, uh, then you then you're in an area which is uh, certainly closer to writing a story and trying to figure out how to how to express yourself. 
Um, what, what, what I'm particular talking about, though, is that is that uh, is that um, a lot of game design is n historically game design is for yourself, and that's and and your friends, and that's mm -hmm. it. As a profession now, it's more than that. You're designing for much more than yourself, and and so the trick is how how can you how can you uh, um, how can you design for for others? It's a it's a different uh, it's a different thing, and it's not something which has happened that much historically, um, and uh, and and oftentimes you can do both these things. Uh, uh, you can design something for yourself and for an audience, but uh, but uh, um, but if you don't think about it, it's going to be tough. Hmm. So do you think that because we've always had games, right? People have always had games as part of their lives, but do you, are you kind of are you suggesting that we are as a species getting more literate uh, about games that that we are we're playing them more and as a result we're becoming more sophisticated as an audience and that is is, is that how I, you I, see I it? believe that's yeah. true yeah yeah and and then so what kinds of games do you think we will see uh, it, with this greater literacy and and like uh, that's that's hard to say there's <laughs> a, I mean there's all sorts of exciting stuff going on uh, the the uh, um, the just yeah, I mean the, the the computer in general is just a, is an amazing game tool, um, and the ability to connect people uh, and and get these things like twenty four hour games and uh, um, and, uh, and 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 games you can invest as much time as you like in and uh, 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 just it's it's changed it's 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 changed so much about the way we think about games that. Uh, uh, um, It'd be it'd be hubris to try to uh, to to, to yeah. say you know where it's going. Yeah, uh, and I mean I guess that that's what we do as game designers. That is that's the games you make are your answer to that question. Yes. Yeah. So I, you you you've already been answering that question. Yeah. Um, I kind of think it's the best time ever to be a game player or a game designer, right? I'm not over optimistic, right? This is right now. It is right in the world. It's in history. It's kind of the best time. Uh, I, to I, be alive for people like us. Do you I, agree? I, I, I do. Yes. Uh, it's, Good. It's, it's a very <laughs> it's kind exciting of amazing. time. It's, yeah, I know it is. Yeah. Because we often think, I mean, we often think, oh, well, I'm alive during a very special time. It's very unique because that's part of the human's, you know, tendency to the bias yeah. towards, you know, thinking near the center of the universe. But I think in this case, it actually is kind of true. <laughs> well, <laughs> Make an exception. Uh, well, what, one, and one thing that's striking when you look at the history of games is also uh, how little information there is there. I mean, the, the fact that uh, people, it's so poorly documented, uh, I mean, that, that in itself indicates a real major change that we're actually documenting what's going on and what, what the games are and categorizing them. You look back at, uh, and, and these games appear and you have no idea what they're based on or, you know, what the community playing it was. There'll just be sort of a random mention in a, in a book on, uh, yeah. on this game being played and, uh, and you'll find a uh, hundred years later the same game's being played but you still don't know what it is. And it's just uh, the fact that nobody would write, write, you know, thought it was important enough to, to save yeah. is, uh, is striking to me. Yeah. Um, are there particular designers that you find inspiring, or people that whose work you you follow? Or? Others, sure. Uh, uh, and, and, um, you are going to uh, uh, make me draw a blank, though. But, oh, I, uh, no, but, I, uh, I could guess. <laughs> I could maybe. I um, would Rainer Kinesia or. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I, uh, well, from the from the from the uh, German board game market, sure. I certainly uh, uh, I, I really like uh, Klaus Teuber. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, the the thing about um, Settlers of Catan, and I mean, he first of all he's got an amazing breadth, uh, but Settlers of Catan is 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 sort of the the uh, the the, the uh, pinnacle. The, the fi uh, it's been the most successful of the of the German game movement. And one of the things I really find uh, inspiring about that is is that it that it has what I what I was talking about there. It has a reasonable amount of luck. Mm. And when a game game experts play it, they say, "Oh, I like the game, but there's too much luck." And I think that's one of the reasons why it's been so successful. And when you look at a lot of the other games in the in the, in the market, like uh, like uh, Puerto Rico and uh, which are, are you know excellent games, much less luck. 
uh, not nearly as successful mm -hmm. as, as that. And, and, uh, and so I, I really uh, uh, admire that design. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, 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 Sid Meier, uh, mm -hmm. just uh, uh, the fact that somebody has managed to, like, t trying to sell turn-based strategy games to anybody is really, really hard. And it's nice, if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be able to point to civilization to see uh, somebody can make it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, so part of this new era, this golden age that we live in, uh, in addition to having more uh, defined authorship and clear kind of uh, creators, um, is along with that is the idea that games are, are products. Um, and uh, one of the things that you sometimes hear about Magic, or I've heard anyway, is that you know Magic is is a is a brilliant game, but it's that that it's flawed because. Of, it, because of the commercial aspect of it, because you have to purchase the cards, and therefore that's a kind of blemish on this otherwise brilliant thing. Um, but I, to me, I, I don't really think that that's true. Like I think that um, magic, you know, one of the the aspects, one of the aspects of this complicated beauty is that it is that it has this relationship to to commerce, um, and that in some ways uh, the fact that it is. A, a commercial product is is what has allowed it to self-sustain and to grow over time and get more beautiful as more people play it. Um, but I'm interested in your thoughts on that relationship, whether that is something that that you think about and, and how. I, I I have thought a lot about it, uh, and and uh, and I I I mean I find uh, uh, as as you've expressed uh, the, the relationship uh, there uh, beautiful, um, but uh, but. From the very earliest days with Magic, uh, um, I mean, people would ask me, what, "What's your PhD in marketing?" <laughs> and uh, and uh, and and I had to constantly, I mean, like the, the thing which I set myself as a goal was was constantly try to try to make the game uh, as uh, as broad as possible in that you could play with a sm as small an investment as you could, uh, as 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 small an investment as uh, as we could get away with, um, and so mm. and so the way we did that. There were a lot of different ways we did that, but I, may, I, I you know I tried to make sure, for instance, the common cards were not, as a rule, weaker than the the rare cards. In fact, they were they were more broadly useful, and the rare cards, uh, rather than being more powerful, which is sort of what you would intuitively expect, um, uh, as a rule, what I wanted them to be was was interesting and narrow, so that if you were if you were an entrenched player, you could buy this variety of game. But you weren't directly buying power, hmm. and and of course, as you get more cards, you you do get more power because you've got all these more, all these choices. But but very late in the like two or three years after the game was released, uh, I would go to different card shops and people would bring up the decks of cards and say, "I'm going to beat you with my my amazing super rare deck." And they would sit down and they would play with this this deck, and I would say, "Okay, well, um, I'll try this deck. I'll, I'll try this deck of all common cards." And I would beat them. I mean, it was just am amazing how how often that would happen. It's just because people uh, didn't recognize how strong th there was this assumption that the rare cards were, mm. were powerful. And and so, um, and so so I think there's some things which help uh, keep the the financial aspect of it, the 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 uh, the, the business aspect of it in, in check. And I think those are important. Yeah, uh, at uh, GDC this year, the Scaphalias talk. Uh, on the subject was extremely good, and and we found it very kind of inspiring, and uh, and it just it kind of demonstrates uh, how much uh, games like social games, for example, with microtransactions have have to learn, you know, about these issues, uh, and and how how balancing those things is is, is actually possible. Uh -huh. um, if so, if you had to, let me ask you a question: If you had to go back. Uh, now and redesign Magic the Gathering uh, from scratch. Are there any things about it that you would change? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a complicated question. Yeah. Um, if, if I were going back to uh, 93 and releasing it, it would be, it would be, I mean, there were, there would be some, uh, some very technical things in the rules I would change. Uh, like ju because I think the rules have simplified over the years in, huh. in, in, a, in a good way, um, but the card mix itself was really good back then. But I wouldn't do that right now because people are too good for that card right, mix. Right. Right. Um, uh, so so um, so I, I think most of my changes going back would have been would have been 
would have been, you know, yeah, just things cleaning up the rules. It's funny because it, it doesn't seem like the rules have simplified over the years. To a casual observer, it looks like they've gotten more complex as, as different kinds of variations or, or elements have been introduced. But can well, you give there, an example? There, okay, of, well, yeah. there, there has been some complexity introduced, like the uh, planeswalkers are very complicated, and I, I didn't think much of them at first. Now I'm kind of on the fence about them. Um, but uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, complexity in the original release, which, which, which wasn't apparent because it appealed to players. Uh, there was this idea, uh, this idea that, 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 that there would be inconsistencies, and players would figure it out. Uh, and once they made a rule, it would find it, 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 they would stick with that. And I was thinking of it more uh, as, as from a grassroots mm -hmm. uh, Gra the, uh, the grassroots would figure out exactly how things worked, uh, and I tried to get most of it down, but I didn't. I didn't try to make it so a computer could play. Mm -hmm. right? And and so when you play the game seriously, though, that that doesn't stand. You've got to you've got to know how how you've got to know what the rules are. So you mean um, things like like resolving the stack? Yeah, exactly. That, that kind the of stack okay. the stack is is seems complex, but. It's less complex than the than 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 the resolution of the beginning, which uh, was was just inconsistent. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, are there uh, changes over the years to to Magic? I mean, it's been a long time since. How long has since Magic was first created? Was it eighteen years or something like that? Ninety three was when it was first published. Uh, okay. Created was two years before that. Um, and. Are there are there things that have happened over that time that, are, are, in general, has the game improved, or are there things that you feel have been lost in in the game? As it's um, it, it 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 goes. I mean, what, uh, one of the things about a game like Magic is that it evol it it obviously evolves much more than than a game like you know Monopoly, mm -hmm. um, and it, it's it's card mix is changing all the time, and uh, and and uh, do that the environment is always is always changing. The general evolution for it, uh, I, I think, has been two steps forward, one step back. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes they they make a step in the wrong way, but 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 then they usually correct. So examples of that, I mean, that's illustrated recently. They they made uh, uh, an addition of Magic where they went, they they just they they made an attempt to really get the simplest cards, uh, uh, which were a, a lot of the sort of cards which were published originally. You know, just. Vanilla creatures, very simple effects, and so that because they wanted to make the game broad for people coming in, and when they started playing with these cards, they said, "Wow, this is actually really fun, even for people who know what they're doing, playing with these simple effects." Um, and and so that would be an example of them sort of taking, you know, realizing that they had taken a step back at some point mm -hmm. uh, by over complexifying. Um, and then another thing would be these planeswalkers, which I think are they're very very complicated, uh, uh, and 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 so I. My, my philosophy with the game was that uh, was that you know this this easy set of this this set of rules which was as easy as I could get away with, and then everything else you learn from the cards, mm -hmm. and so with the planeswalkers that sort of extends beyond that where where you see a planeswalker you have no idea how it works and you can't find it in the rules you got to go online or find somebody who knows. Hmm. So, um, has there been much innovation in the realm of CCGs? from other companies. It seems to me like Wizards of the Coast has really kind of led the way in most of the kind of like moves forward. Is that? Well, po Pokemon. Correct? Okay. Uh, Pokemon because uh, um, it's the relationship there between, uh, in the gameplay itself was not particularly innovative, but the relationship there between the gameplay and the property, like the story behind it uh, hmm. was. It, uh, it, it had, it, 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 the, um, the marriage between the world in Magic and the cards is uncomfortable. Between Pokemon World and the cards is very, very clean. Hmm. And that accounts in part for its uh, long-term success. Um, the uh, Mechanically, I mean, there have been a lot of things, like, uh, I mean, I have to start getting into, into a lot of the real details of the game, uh, uh, which I, I don't uh, feel comfortable doing, but... Uh, but things like uh, uh, the the mana system in Magic is a very swingy system. It's very there's a lot of luck in it, hmm. and so I think that's appropriate for a first game. But a lot of games coming out have tried to appeal to the experts and they've tried to reduce the luck, and so it's less swingy, and that could be considered a step forward also. Right. 
Um, now, I understand that you are, after uh, years of not being directly involved, are jumping back into uh, magic design with the with the, uh, a forthcoming uh, a set, uh, Innistrad, is that right? Uh, I don't know what the name is, uh, oh, okay. but but yeah, it's, it's the set. It that's in, it's the set that's coming out in <laughs> September. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, hook, line, and sinker. No, that wasn't it. It was uh, I don't know. I I I I, I, re I recognize the code name if you gave me that. Okay. But uh, shake. It was shake, rattle, and roll. I worked okay. on shake. Okay. And uh, um, thank you. And uh, um. I, I'd say I work on a set every every couple years, okay. and I put a couple months in, a few, uh, t uh, two or three months in with the design team. Yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, and that, and that, that's a lot of fun. Magic is is super fun to design for, much much easier than working on new games. Uh, and and so I have to sort of pace myself because otherwise I could just get sucked into it. It's a uh, with with a uh, working on a new game. Uh, I never know whether whether what I've done is is is. Uh, going to be broadly fun, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, and I never know whether whether I'm heading in the right direction. With magic, I know there's an audience. There's so many people I'd be working with who know the game very well. They can see the, they, they they can see the subtleties of what I've designed immediately. It's a it's just it's it's a completely different experience. Um, is there anything you can tell us about this forthcoming set? Give us a little taste of what it's. Is there a theme or any uh, new cards that you've been working on? That I cannot. I get okay. in trouble. All right. Fair uh, enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, um, one of the things that I love about Magic uh, and, and, and particular cards is the relationship of mechanic to theme. Um, because there is a, a more of a distance there, uh, because it's more abstract than, say, in a video game where you have this much more simulational or, or representational relationship, in Magic, you'll you'll have a card, and it's like it allows you to do something, and then and then it has a a theme, a name, and a, a tiny little fragment of story. And there's a kind of delight in seeing how the how that mechanic is related to that that theme. Um, and I'm just curious about, you know, in the design process, is is does one usually come first? Do you think of the mechanic first, or is it or is there a back and forth between the two? Or? It, it works both ways. Okay. And in fact, in fact, there's a, a parallel there to uh, to uh, paper game design uh, in general, um, oftentimes uh, I, I just came out with a, a game, uh, King of Tokyo, uh, which is a board game, and and it's got a rich theme, uh, monsters uh, attacking a city, uh, but but the but it was driven by mechanics. I came up with this this idea for mechanic, and later we thought thought of what 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 fit it. Um, there. Are, there are other games uh, where where I had a theme in mind, so I get this game called Pecking Order, which was based on this theme of uh, birds fighting over, over, over the best perches, and I, that was actually something I was watching, and I thought I'd like to make a game modeling what I'm seeing, hmm. and so then I, I designed the mechanics the other way. It's the same thing with Magic cards, where sometimes we come up with this effect we want to see in the game, and then we have to figure out how can we thematically uh, make that work, and other times we have this we want to see a card. With the title uh, uh, "Unholy Chainsaw," and then we said, "Well, how are we going to mechanically do that and make it feel like a chainsaw?" Wow. Um, so, are there so since leaving Wizards of the Coast, you've worked on a number of different projects. Um, super interesting stuff. Spectromancer, I love. Uh, uh, Great Dal Moody is is a, a beloved game of myself and my family, and and um, uh, but you you know you've worked on a number of kind of smaller scale projects, uh, smaller teams, and and uh, independent projects. Are there, are there anything? Is there anything big in your future? Is there anything that you want to work on of, of, of a kind of a grand scale? Anything that that's lurking around like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, I've I've been work I've worked on a lot of computer game projects, which have uh, have 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 been canceled at one stage or another. Uh, it's, it's a, and many of those are quite one of the one of the problems is that is that I'm always for the last. Uh, Ten, ten odd years I've been uh, trying to get computer games. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at two different things. I'm looking at one, alternative revenue models, mm -hmm. which now are becoming the norm on uh, on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, and so I've been trying to sell those for ten years, and the market's caught up with it. Mm -hmm. And and then the other thing is I want to see games which uh, fit somewhere in the vast gulf between uh, 
um, the traditional, uh, more simulative mm -hmm. computer game, like uh, a, like a, a StarCraft or a shooter, and and uh, and and a, a paper game like poker or Scrabble, because when I I enjoy the simulative games, you know, it's like I'll, I'll play uh, I'll play. Half-Life, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Half-Life, or uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 TF2, mm -hmm. and and really enjoy myself. But then then I'll play uh, Scrabble online, and and I'll just be it's like, wow, this 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 is a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, I mean, of course, Scrabble in real life is fun, but here I don't have to mess with the tiles, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I I've got my instant matching, and uh, and I can play somebody uh, from around the world, and uh, and uh, um, and. And I've lost something big because I'm not playing across the table, but I've gained a bunch too. Mm -hmm. And I, I ask myself why there aren't games which are in, why there aren't many games which are in this vast gulf between these things. And 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 so I've been trying to populate that too. Wow, I I am so enthusiastic about that. That's I think a really important and and, and exciting uh, domain to be working in. Um, actually, let's open it up. If people want to ask uh, uh, questions, can we can we just. Uh, do we have a mic that we can? Is this the mic? Yeah, turn on. Let's uh, let's turn this on. Check, check. Um, and why don't we uh, why don't we pass it over? Why don't we start with uh, Ian Bogost? How about that? He set his hand up, kind of dapperly back there. <laughs> uh, thanks. This is a great talk. I'm I'm really glad that I was able to catch it while I'm here in New York. Um, I'm very afraid that I'm going to do one of those things where I ramble and then say. Not really a question, more of a comment. So to avoid <laughs> don't, that, don't do that, no, I'm not going to do that. And to avoid doing that, I'm going to ask the question up front and then just say a couple of very brief things to clarify it. The question is, in, as I was hearing you talk, I, I wondered if this this relationship between luck and skill is sort of like a, a subset or an instance of a of a kind of bigger thing, a sort of relationship between judgment and, and luck in general. And what I was thinking about in particular as a kind of analogy is this concept in um, in philosophy called moral luck. Um, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but it's like uh, Bernard Williams and, and Thomas Nagel um, are the kind of key figures. And the, the idea is that you can be subject to moral judgment even though some part of your actions seem to also be subject to luck. So if I, if I um, try to murder uh, Eric Zimmerman, um, but, but I fail because he ducks out of the way as my, as my, uh, as my samurai sword um, is about to, to lop his head off, then you know, I might be subject to... to well, that sounds like skill to me. <laughs> <laughs> This is, a, this is a really you know, vivid th question. This, this would be this would be um, uh, less of a, of, a, of, a, of a grievous act. It would be attempted murder right. uh, rather than murder. And and there, you know there's all sorts of ways that Nagel breaks this down that we don't we don't want to linger on. But like for example, like you know there's results based on outcomes. There's results based on constitution. My you know my, I'm physically less able to 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 uh, to run fast compared to other people. For example, there's um, there's luck based on sort of causal chains. Like you know I, I might sure. be good at Scrabble because I pulled the right tiles, or I might be good at Scrabble because I had a predilection for reading that led to my, my knowledge of, of a larger number of words and so forth. So anyway, to, to repeat the question, sort of, you know, do you see like this kind of pattern of luck and skill you know, kind of existing elsewhere in the world, is sort of luck, luck and judgment being really weirdly conflated and messy kind of all over the place yeah. and we're kind of borrowing that into games? Yeah, I, I hadn't thought of the, the luck and judgment, but I do see, I mean, to me, this, uh, this the definition of luck, which I worked my way through as being just if you can't predict it, it's luck. Um, that's that's a very uh, I think that's a very twentieth uh, um, century uh, philosophical outlook, right? Like like we look around and we see w and, and and we we view the world more and more in terms of probabilities and 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 th and, and and it's inescapable. Whereas uh, um, Formally, there's this idea you could reduce everything to something you can understand, um, and and so and so I believe I believe in in, in games. Uh, that attitude carries well to games. You can you can reduce some things in 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 life. We can we can break down these probabilities if if you if you will uh, uh, suss out some of the judgment chain, uh, and and as you do, you change those probabilities. But it's still. When you get to the, uh, uh, we're living in a probabilistic world, and and our games are, are a reflection of that. Wow, thanks. Um, another question uh, right behind you. Yes. Great, thanks. Um, I I'm interested in physical games, movement-based computer games, and you alluded in your talk to the um, the role of luck there based on your physical abilities. Um, so we try to train our body to get better to reduce the amount of luck. Um, which we know from sports. Just wondering whether you can talk a little bit more about 
what the role of the computer is in that. Now that we know we've got sports and we train to be better at sports, now that we've got these computer-based, movement-based games, sure. Um, how does that yeah, deal uh, with the luck there? So, so right, in, in, in sports, uh, in sports, you can affect how much luck there is by, like, you raise you raise the basketball hoop, uh, and you add luck to the game, um, and uh, and and so and so whether or not it's intentional, this this thing of uh, like how you set up the golf course is going to introduce more or less variance. So, in in computers, uh, I think one of the ways that luck has been introduced, for example, would be. Uh, uh, like obviously in in uh, in Team Fortress they're doing it in this overt way, but other shooters have done it in 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 this way where they introduce a very high skill thing, the headshot, uh, and and that that's the crit. And a lot of people find that more satisfying, even though uh, it's a very skill testing thing. It's also a very luck testing. It, you know, it, it's, it also introduces luck into the game. In that when I uh, when I as a new player shoot at you, I might get a headshot. With me. It's a five percent chance. Uh, with somebody else, they, they you know they can they can master this, um, and so and so I think I think in, the, in and I think that's analogous to 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 moving the hoop higher uh, or something like that. Is that or were you trying to get to something else or? So what 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 should we do as game designers for these type of movement based games? Um, should we think raise the hoop? Should we think about raising the hoop based on? the current doing, so what we can't do in sports, right? So we can only raise the hoop once, right? And then we play the game. But in computer games, we could raise the hoop right. all the time, for example. Is that what, yeah. you're, what you're saying? That, uh, well, th then, then you could set the hoop, at, I mean, you could, you could set, set the hoop at, at the position which is giving you the variance you want, uh, I suppose. Uh, and, 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 so, and so there, you're using a more covert injection of luck, where it's, it's, you, can, you, you can master it more than you can master the the critical hits in Team Fortress, um, which is an overt injection of luck, um, by making it so that uh, 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 for yeah by by making it so that uh, so that uh, like like you take you take take the example of a of a shooter if you if you're going to introduce luck by making headshots you can make the head large. And then uh, you'll have a certain variance in, in how how, mu how many uh, wh what percentage of people will be able to hit that, and what there'll be a curve as to as to as to how often they're hitting it. And as you shrink that down, you're raising the hoop, and uh, and you can set that at, to, at 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 the point where you want your variance, I suppose. Hmm. Do you follow esports at all? Do you um, watch uh, StarCraft? Um, you know, uh, <laughs> that's GSL good. Or the GSL or <laughs> Or Street Fighter uh, VODs or anything. I mean, uh, is that something? You I, I I do occasionally. I don't. I don't. Uh, what I, what I do is I, I I like to follow it in the sense of of uh, somebody will will tell me something interesting is happening. They'll catch me up and then I'll watch it. I like watching serious gameplay. I think it's very interesting. But uh, I don't follow any particular. Yeah. I mean, I think it's kind of on the rise. I really feel like a lot of people uh, feel like the, this year could be a watershed year for for esports. Um, Starcraft kind of evolving beyond uh, co uh, Korea. Uh, into uh, Europe and North America in, in a bigger way. So, yeah. um, and I, I think it's, uh, I've always been interested in the crossover between high level magic uh, players and, uh, and, and uh, online poker, for example, uh, and professional poker. Um, so people like David Williams, uh, and there's a couple of other very high level uh, competitive magic yep. players who've made the transition to being extremely successful uh, poker players. Yep. Um, and uh, which is, I mean, to me, there's a similarity between all of these, uh, you know, high-level uh, fighting games and uh, real-time strategy, uh, magic, uh, poker. It just seems so interesting to see high-level competition uh, shares a lot of the same values, even though in some cases it's phys it feels like a physical skill. Uh, in something like StarCraft, you have actions per minute. You have these guys with this incredible physical skill, uh, this dexterity. It's almost like uh, a piano playing. Uh, the you know the, the, the way they mm -hmm. do it, um, and yet they they, they you know, high level StarCraft players also become uh, very successful high level uh, uh, poker players, and so mm -hmm. really it's it's this thing that's happening uh, mm -hmm. under the hood, uh, almost. Uh, of course, now that poker has been shut down, yeah, um, <laughs> it is uh, it's a, after Black Friday. It's quite quite sad. I've, I've, I've um, actually w one of the things I've wondered is, is is if there's actually more 
like you can define skill in lots of different ways, but uh, but I've wondered if there's more skill in, in StarCraft than there is in chess. And uh, because my intuition is that there is. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there must be. It seems like StarCraft is essentially almost a chess variant uh, with, with lots more, the, the possibility space is just kind of bigger and right. more complex. In and then there's also a physical component. Right, in, in, yeah, in, in, the, in the sense that, yeah, yeah, that, that, that there's more, more levels of you, you could be at. Yeah, yeah. But. yeah. Um, is another question? How about we go back here? Hi. Sorry, direct comment or based on what you were Okay, we'll, we'll pass, it, we'll pass it over uh, after this one. Um, Ophir, you can, you can wait. Yeah. One, one question. Okay. Hi. We'll uh, remember. Getting back to the um, Pokemon versus um, Magic uh, comparison you made earlier, uh, I'm very interested in the marriage of story to the mechanics of the game. Can you talk a little bit about some of the successes and some of the failures that you've seen in your experience, maybe some devices that you've found aside from cutscenes in terms of integrating the two and what works and what doesn't? Well, uh, uh, sure. Um, it's a, it, it's a, a certainly a really interesting topic. Uh, I mean, the success, in my mind, the, the biggest success is uh, in, in the virtual realm is Portal. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm in awe of Portal. Yeah. Um, and my general rules have been that that uh, that putting story in game that that the the the, the thing that's difficult to put in is uh, is narrative. Uh, everything else, character, uh, the different flavor, uh, 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 sort of a world setting, mm -hmm. that all works really well. And 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 so and so in particular. With Pokemon, you see that they've got all these characters, the monsters. You've got a world, and the world has these rules, and and the narrative uh, is sort of independent of that. They don't put that on the on the card game uh, at all, and and I think that works really well. Like as a uh, as a like not knowing anything else, if there's a game and it's got a rich world, rich characters, but it doesn't tell me anything about how I play it, uh, that's a great place to start. Putting in narrative as they've done in Portal successfully, uh, I mean it's a very very light one, but uh, but the, but it works really well, um, is is more of a challenge, and and that's because uh, um, in, at the heart of games, what's interesting is making choices, and at the heart of of uh, narrative, I believe it's it's being told what happened, and uh, those aren't opposites, but they. It takes some work to get them to play well together. Hmm. Um, can we pass it over to uh, Ophir? So, uh, so uh, you were <laughs> talking about how the differences between chess and StarCraft and which one had more skill. And I'd actually like to get into that a little more. Uh, I've played both. I'm, have been, I'm not amazing at either, but, well, I'm pretty amazing at both, but <laughs> not. But more importantly, uh, I feel like chess as a whole is a game of almost complete information. The only information you don't have is what's going on in the other person's head, and you can actually figure that out just based on the pieces he moves. In StarCraft, there's, for, there's a few things in it. First of all, there's just a, right off the bat, there's a randomness based on spawning location in maps that are larger than two players spawning next to a certain race as a certain race already puts you at a disadvantage. Another thing is you might end up scouting them in the wrong direction and you lose 10 seconds. There's also a fog of war. Even with good scouting, it's almost you don't have complete information because there are times you can't you just can't see the opponent. And even I not I'm not like trying to talk against StarCraft, I think it's one of the most deep games there are. I just don't... B believe me, those aren't, those aren't marks against it yeah. in my eyes. Those are, those are I, wonderful I, things about I it. I think it's great. I think it makes the game interesting. If you wanted to, you could just make everyone play the same race. There would be only one unit, and whoever right-clicked the other unit first would win. No, I, and that would be one almost entirely skill. Mm. But I think between chess and StarCraft, just because of the information that you have... Well, yeah. It, well, I, I, you, you certainly introduced some 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 good points. Certainly, there's more uh, luck in StarCraft with uh, certain maps. Uh, um, when I was thinking of it, I was actually thinking of like these two-player maps I would play, 
and I was wondering, with those two player maps, they've always got the same spawn location, so the only, I mean, there's thug of war, uh, and then there's a, uh, I don't know what race the other person has chosen, but I had the suspicion uh, that that my opponent would beat me, uh, that if a, my opponent was better than me, they'd beat me all the time, uh, and that it was really difficult to get close. Um, but I, I'm not that good a StarCraft player, so you'd have a better idea of what that's like at the top. Now, one... <laughs> Now, now uh, one thing though, though is 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 with the complete knowledge in chess, you have to you have to weigh it against the thing like the 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 guess of digit of pi. There's complete knowledge there as well, but you just can't see it. It's effectively random, and so and so uh, in 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 practice, uh, a game of complete knowledge can have luck. And uh, and I, I could give you a game, uh, uh, you know, a, a game which uh, which which would have more luck and would be uh, much more deterministic than uh, than than StarCraft. Uh, but uh, you, I'm sure, know both games better than I do. Uh, and and so, uh, but but the, but the, but the, but it shouldn't be about you know there, there's luck introduced here. It should be about what it, what it should be about is how often the better players win than the the worst players. Yeah, I think no. it's with okay. with StarCraft One, it might have been closer. Q, Q, Q more. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we pass it right back. We pass it back. Hi, um, I was wondering how much, when you're designing, you think about the two different types of luck. If you divide luck into my own personal luck and my ability to succeed at a task, as opposed to environmental luck, where we all have the same chance to do things, but we make choices based upon how the world changes. So as he's talking about StarCraft, the type of luck he's talking about is things are spawning in different places, and each of us as players must take advantage of that changing world, as opposed to the critical hit luck, where I'm trying to hit something and I have to roll a die. Do you find more mature players prefer the more environmental luck? or? Uh, yeah, I think the ana the an uh, this uh, kind of analogous to cards versus uh, versus dice. Uh, um, one of the things I really like about cards, I mean, you can make card games which are just dice games, but you deal a hand uh, of bridge or poker or something like that, and that effectively it gives you the environment, and then you you play that environment. You may be uh, in a favorable position because of the environment, but how you take advantage of it is 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 uh, is, is more interesting, um, and uh, and so yeah, I, I, I do think uh, uh, I do think about it in those terms, and and uh, and I think uh, I think they both have a place. Uh, I, I tend I think I think the environmental luck is, mu is has the potential of being much more interesting. Thank you. Um, why don't we pass it right down here to the gentleman in the brown shirt? My question is about Netrunner. Uh, which is a game that I thought was very uh, fun to play and flavorful, but uh, just had sort of had trouble finding its audience um, in the 90s when it came out, mostly due to competition with, uh, with uh, other CCGs flooding the market. So my question is, has anybody uh, asked after that property in recent years? Um, I'm thinking, uh, I would, would think about developing it into, a, into like a DS or a handheld type game uh, giving access to the full set, but I would like to see that game back in some form. So I'm wondering if anybody has asked after it. Facebook, right? Yeah, could be. Uh, uh, there's been some interest uh, from fans. Uh, there's been no real uh, uh, businesses that are interested. Um, and part of the problem is that uh, the 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 game is owned by Wizards and it's uh, uh, by Hasbro, I should say, and uh, and. Uh, it's in, in one of those awkward positions where where uh, they they're not going to do anything with it, but then if they sell it and it does well, somebody will get in trouble. <laughs> um, so, but but I've I've thought about uh, like if anybody can get it back, it would be me. And I've thought about getting it back myself and uh, and doing something with it. I think one of its failings, like it, when it when it came out, is it was it won a lot of awards, is, and uh, some people think it's the best trading card game ever. Um, and I actually. Uh, uh, Drank that Kool Aid for a while, uh, <laughs> but but it came actually came back to I think actually Magic is better as a trading card game than Netrunner. Netrunner part of the problem with it was it it, it, it felt like it really wanted to be a standalone game, 
And so I'd like to see it more. If I did it again, it would be more as a standalone game. Cool. Um, right behind you? Yeah. Uh, so as somebody who played a lot of Magic when it first came out, uh, it was one of my first experiences uh, with something a uh, player as designer, where I really felt like I was creating a game as I was making it. Uh, and I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about something like where I feel like that's happened a lot more in recent years, something that's continuing to happen, uh, how you have enough structure that there is a game in place, but also enough freedom for the player to feel like a designer. And then secondly, uh, as someone who got out of Magic <laughs> relatively early, uh, because I felt like I didn't have the cards to succeed, whether or not that's uh, an actual thing, you talked about it being a perception, uh, how you fight against that perception. Uh, yeah. Uh, the the th the allowing players to become a designer is is something that that that, that uh, I, I think actually is where where the concept of magic came from because it was something which I I loved to do with games was was modify them so when we played chess I played a bunch of chess but then then I started playing with all sorts of wacky variations uh, and uh, and pl would play Monopoly uh, with with different variations and uh, and uh, and and so forth and and so and so. The idea that that a player can construct their own game experience, I think, was uh, in my mind when 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 putting together Magic, and and I think that idea of customizing your game experience, um, uh, I don't know what Magic's relationship to that concept is, but it's very it's much more popular now, right? This 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 idea that uh, uh, that you can that that the player can customize something about their game experience. Um, and, uh, uh, and and of course, one of the places I got that was Dungeons and Dragons, where where both the person setting up the game, especially the person setting up the game, but but also the people playing the game, uh, really can customize their experience a lot. Um, and what was the second perception? People's perception. Perception about the game. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the uh, the thing the thing with well. The, so much of how much you have to spend in a game like Magic is depends on who you're playing with, and and if your if your buddies are spending a lot of money and they're uh, and they're playing uh, decks which involve old cards or something like that, then 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 you've got to convince them to do something else, or 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 you got to play a different game, um, or you got to get different friends. Um, <laughs> so so <coughs> so with me. I mean, like, like it's not just it's not just money. It's also investment of time. Uh, uh, keeping up with a game like Magic can be, you know, if they're investing a lot of time into the game, uh, that that's almost as bad. Um, so, uh, but but there are play groups which get a, get away with not much time and not much money. Uh, the ways you know one of the ways they do that is is they they have like leagues and and they'll use the same box of cards. Week after week after week, and uh, and they'll draft off those cards, for example, so everybody has equal access to it. Or they'll deal them out, and then they play with those cards uh, for for a few months, and then they get another set. Uh, if that play group has imposed those sorts of restrictions on themselves, uh, then then you can get a very sort of economical play experience. Uh, if you feel like you've got to uh, got to participate in the newest sets which are coming out, and you've got to build from those cards. Well, that's you know, there are people at Wizards who want you to think that, uh, but but it uh, and and your friends may believe it, but you don't have to. Uh, you can you can play with the with a, with a modest set of cards for a long time. Um, I'm gonna pass it over right here. Um, I was wondering uh, when you're designing a new game, um, how often, how much you keep your intended audience in mind in terms of luck versus skill. Like you talked about how. As players get more advanced, generally the level of luck decreases versus the level of skill. And whether, if you're designing like a low luck, high skill game, whether that's inherently marketed towards more advanced players and <laughs> vice versa. Uh, I, I, I do keep, I do keep that in mind. I, what, I, I always, always, always ask myself whether there's a way to uh, inject luck into the game. In a way which makes sense, if, there, if 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 it isn't there already, and in particular, one of the things I really like to do is inject hidden information into the game. That's like my favorite thing, uh, and and uh, and 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 that gets into 
the, the fellow in the back's comment about environmental uh, luck versus uh, versus overt just <coughs> just dice. Um, now it's partially a cheat. I like those games, so I'm designing for myself and my audience. Uh, I'm in in this position where where uh, I mean one of my one of, I believe one of my strengths as a designer is that is that I I like this very broad design. Uh, I like things that are pretty simple. That that uh, that that there's some luck. That there's some hidden information. And I think those are very broad design principles. Whereas other people don't naturally like that. And they have, they either have to uh, uh, develop that taste and think about it from a more of a professional point of view, or design for a different audience. Um, so, um, back here, the yellow shirt. Hi. Uh, so I'm I'm fascinated by this uh, relationship that you talked about between luck and skill and accessibility. Um, you know, and and specifically, you mentioned that you know it's easy to find a board game that that you know any level of people can can work with, but with video games, it's more difficult. And and that that seems interesting to me because. Um, uh, you know, I know, for instance, for the past couple summers and then this summer as well, Wizards has been like bringing out this, you know, multiplayer game that they uh, based on magic, where they throw in some randomized element, you know, sure. and that that increases the, you know, accessibility. Um, and you know, I mean, that it, it's hard to tweak a game if you want a game to be five percent more lucky, you know, that that the you know you. Usually, luck is pretty structural and uh, and it's kind of coarse, so it's it's hard to 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 you know just tweak it. But I recall in reading uh, about the design and, uh, of the the uh, Magic uh, console game, the Duels of the Planeswalkers, that uh, the 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 game literally stacks the deck for newer players. It 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 makes the deck so that you don't get mana flooded and you don't get mana screwed and. Uh, contrary wise as you get better it makes the opponents it stacks the opponent's deck and th this this was curious to me because I, I thought that you know in a, with a computer you can tweak the luck you yeah. know I, I, as, as much as you like uh, so, so uh, I've been I like everybody else I assume I've been playing portal 2 and somebody mentioned you know it's, it's it seems like a more you know a, a little bit easier or, or smoother experience than the original portal and one of the differences I realized was that when you shoot a portal in the original portal, it kind of lands wherever you hit it. And in Portal 2, they've tweaked it so that it lands where it needs to, you know, if it's a little bit off. Sure. And, and you know, I'm, I'm so, so is this just a, a shortcoming of, of the designers not realizing that they can increase accessibility by playing with luck and tipping the scales, or, or, or what? Yeah, I mean, I'm always a little uncomfortable with the with the the tweaking the odds in ways people don't understand, like like you've exp uh, d described magic doing, uh, and and that's because uh, I mean I, I think you've got this uh, this concept here of a, of a deck, and and if you start playing with what that means, then then you suddenly lose uh, touch with what your in your intuition is is incorrect. Um, uh, but I don't think it's always wrong. I just feel uncomfortable with it. And, and, and every time somebody says, let's, let's uh, you know, something like you've got a 5% chance of succeeding, but we'll ma guarantee you succeeded after at least 20 times. You know, that, that always rubs me the wrong way. Mm. Uh, because I think it's, I think it's, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, it feels like cheating in, 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 a, in, in, a, in a way which isn't helpful. Well, it is helpful. But <laughs> I don't know. It, it makes me it, it makes me feel dirty. Is what it does. Yeah, um, yeah, <coughs> I agree. Um, the thing with 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 single player games, though, uh, it's it's it, it's it's really different. Uh, like uh, um, uh, it certainly, you know, I, I would not think that Portal would be helped if they made it so that uh, so that uh, you know y your your Portal was less accurate. <laughs> uh, um, and and uh, and you didn't hit where you wanted to hit all the time. Uh, if if somehow they came out with like a Portal Wars game where you were fighting each other, then then I think that starts to become appropriate uh, to at least think about that. But uh, um, uh, uh, but uh, but I do I do think that uh, to in the broader sense that yeah I, I think any time 
players are playing with each other, it is worth thinking about how can I increase the variance in this game because uh, um, in a way that won't turn off the players because I think it does broaden the number of people who can play together and I think that's really important. This, um, this dirty feeling that you describe uh, when, when, when people sort of soften the edges of, 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 a, of a random process in order to make it conform more closely to, uh, to our biased perceptions of how luck should work, how we think, you know, the sort of gambler's fallacy yeah, yeah, yeah. where we would where we say, it, it, yeah, it's, always, it's, it's such an elusive, I've, I've, I recognize it and I feel the same way and I think, I think it's actually quite important. I think there is a moral dimension there and I think what you're getting at is that there is a moral relationship between the, the game designer and the player, you know, and that, and that part of what you're doing as a designer is, is giving people the opportunity to wrap their heads around this counterintuitive truth about the universe, like that it, dice rolls in this certain way, randomness does, you know, uh, happen in, in, and there are, there are kind of these, these truths and that if we, if we constantly kind of sand off the edges of that, in, in a way we are doing a disservice. It might, it might make the, the game uh, more comfortable or, or kind of sweeter for the player, but we're not really doing them any favors. No, I, I think that's true. That's yeah. a very interesting yeah. uh, uh, topic. Yeah. Um, it was in, uh, right, right here in the white shirt, yes sir. Hi. Um, you talked a little bit about how uh, players' maturity affects their um, tolerance of or appreciation for skill versus luck. And I wonder um, what, uh, what players' idea of what luck actually is affects their tolerance for or appreciation of luck versus skill. And, uh, you know, in um, you know, Western cultures and Eastern cultures, I read somewhere that uh, you know China has a higher incidence of gambling problems because people think that luck sort of works differently than than other than than some people do in, in other countries. But um, I just wonder what you think about that. No, th I think that's a that's a uh, uh, a really good question, and and it uh, um, it actually points out uh, something which is potentially misleading about my talk, which is I talk about luck being everywhere, and then I say you should put more luck in. Um, and <laughs> and uh, um, uh, there are, I mean, th how how that luck is put into a game is is uh, is really important. This uh, this idea of introducing uh, smaller and smaller headshot zones is adding luck to the game, but players are not going to uh, find that nearly as uh, uh, the mature player group, the, the player group that wants their skills uh, um, uh, showcased. Are, are not going to feel as put upon by that as they are with uh, the Valve, the TF2, uh, just direct critical hit system. Um, they, they, the fact that they feel that they can, that they can uh, get better at that than somebody else, as opposed to the TF2 one, uh, um, is fighting against the fact that the, the complete noob can come in and get a, an accidental headshot and level them. Whereas if they didn't have that headshot, they would always own the own the new player because because they'd just be hitting you know seventy five percent more of their shots. Um, uh, so so yeah, th th what what you choose, what sort of luck is introduced makes it makes a really big difference. Uh, um, like uh, like, I really I don't think rando chess would go over with the chess playing community. I think adding it in that way is is not not right. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for maybe a couple more questions right here. Yes. I was just wondering from an academic standpoint, if you see kind of the like conventionalness of, um, I guess the author games and the hyper realness of like Second Life as having like more of a valuable, you know, effect on students that have this interjection of video games now and like, you know, starting from even first grade. Uh, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering if, say, if you if you think like the hyper realness of, say, like Second Life and that yep. kind of virtual feeling of this one-player game is, say, more valuable in terms of its academic success compared to, say, like, you know, these ortho games that you were talking about. Uh, yeah, there, I mean, hyper immer immersive games uh, uh, are. I mean, uh, immersion in a game is is uh, has has a lot of a lot of potential value, and it's it's it it, it can it can uh, it can really draw people in. Uh, what uh, with uh, I I like to 
I like to think this, for certain personalities, there can be a lot of immersion in more abstract games. Uh, and you'll, you'll see people be immersed in different ways. So I, I still see them sort of as being in a, in a, in a, uh, a similar family, so to speak. Um, and, 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 and it's, a, it's certainly a, a, a it's, it, that, that is another topic which is really big and can be talked about quite a bit. Um, how about right here, and then we'll go to you, and then I think we'll go. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks a lot for coming out. So one of the things that's come, out a, uh, come up a lot in this discussion is the idea that we're sort of living in an era now where, you know, suddenly there are people who make games. Like, you can look at a game and you can say, oh, well, yeah, there's probably a lot that that's building on, but there's someone who had a lot to do with the game that I'm playing. Um, so as a designer, um, and... Uh, you know, as one of like the handful of designers that can be said to sort of reach name recognition, um, it do you look at other designers and sort of you, you talked a little bit about how you like you like to add hidden information. Do you have a sense of yourself as a designer, your sort of own your style in relation to other designers that you see? Like, do you think you have sort of a little corner uh, of the design space that you're exploring that you feel like maybe some you know isn't explored enough? Uh, yeah, um, I think I think designers do have uh, styles, personalities uh, in the, in their design. Uh, I, I can often certainly recognize a, a particular person's hand in the game. Um, uh, I I try to keep my palette broad. Uh, like like I, I actually play games that don't initially attract me, and then I try to develop an appreciation for them. Uh, and that's sort of one of the exercises I use to, to, keep, to keep broad as a, as a game designer. But I think my particular style, I, I do like to have hidden information in a game. I don't do it always. Uh, um, like uh, King of Tokyo, this game, which, which uh, this board game I just did, uh, you know, it's like I I'd love it if there were hidden information there, but any way I thought of adding it just felt like it was just tacked on. Um, and uh, um, and the other thing I really I, I really like is is uh, varying the game environment. So that's that's one of the reasons why when, when Dominion came out, I, I just I just loved that game because that is exactly what I was trying to get with a lot of my games. Um, uh, one of my smaller games, Rocketville. Uh, had a card which was an environment card. You turn it up, and it would change one of the rules each game. And, and uh, Dominion was much, much more aggressive in how it wanted to change the environment. It wasn't as aggressive as a trading card game, but it was much more aggressive than you'd seen a board card game in uh, being uh, uh, environment changing. And that uh, trend in, in, in games uh, has, has been really exciting to me because that's uh, that's exactly the sort of thing which uh, which uh, I would have said that I was trying to do. One of the um, one of the things I often think about uh, that kind of gets at the elusive and kind of ambiguous uh, relationship of the creator uh, and the designer uh, to the to the qualities of the game is that if you're talking about a, a film, if you offer me two films and and you say this one is directed by this person, this one is directed by that person, I kind of have the information I need to know to to choose between them. But if I walk into a party and you say, well, there are these two games. And this one is designed by this game designer. This one's you know, designed by American McGee. This one's designed by Shigeru Miyamoto. Um, I might want to know, who am I going to be playing with? That, that might be a, a more, almost as important to me as who designed the game in thinking about the, the, the kinds of experience I'm going to have. And I think that's, that's, that's interesting. I mean, that, that says something uh, about you know, what's different about, about those relationships yeah, true. and, and yeah. where, the, where the beauty comes from. Um, yeah. And how about uh, you, sir, in the blue shirt? Absolutely. Um, this um, topic has been touched upon uh, by many people, but I just want to talk about it a little more, is that um, uh, luck as divination, and luck is like something that is, um, you know, the gods have decided <coughs> such and such. And I think my question would be, um, if you personally are playing a game, uh, and you roll the dice, um, and Lady Luck was in your favor, um, at that instance, do you feel that you fell into a specific slot of randomness, or do you feel that the stars were aligned for you? Um. Uh, uh, that's interesting. Um, the w are, so are you asking me personally? Yeah. Okay, so me personally, 
Uh, I feel like I fell in a, most of the time I feel like I fell in a, a particular slot of randomness. I, 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 I view things kind of mathematical. But uh, hearkening back to, the, I, I, to this point where I try to broaden my play experience, there's a lot of games that as a mathematician I wouldn't be interested in at all. Um, but I play them and I try to understand what, what's going on and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and sometimes I'm, I'm surprised. So for instance, uh, a left, right, center. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this, this, this game, uh, uh, I, I don't know how broadly known it is, uh, but, but you roll your three dice, uh, you, uh, it'll tell you, uh, the die will say nothing, or it'll say pass a dollar to the left, pass a dollar to the right, or put it in the center. And, and, uh, and then the next person rolls. And you just keep going around the table, and eventually only one person has any money left, and they take the pot. And, and it's kind of cool, though, because if you're out, you can get past a dollar, right? It's, it's not, mathematically, in some sense, it's not interesting because everybody's got an equal chance. There's some small amount of work to figure out what your advantage going first is or disadvantage is. Uh, but, but when you actually play it, it's, like it's, it's, it's very exciting because this process that's uh, unfolding is something you don't entirely understand. And it, you can really feel like, like, like fate is smiling upon you or cursing you. Uh, uh, and and there, are certain, there are certain stochastic processes which br really bring that out even for the most, uh, the most stodgy, uh, prob uh, probabilistic viewed person. Um, and and that, that, that gets back to actually, uh, at one point I said I, I like to break people up into, into sort of play categories. I have innovators and honers. Well, there's another two categories I like, which is uh, um, zoners. Uh, which, which sounds, uh, I, I need a less harsh term there because that sounds like a harsh term because, but, uh, and watchers. Uh, so when you're, wa when you're just, when you're just playing because you want to see what happens, uh, you're kind of in a watching mode and, and left, right, center is, is, is great for watchers because they're just watching the money go around and, oh, this person's back in and, uh, and wow, that happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and, and, and in games with, and, and, and some strategic games will be played that way too. You've played with people who will just do something that's, that's completely quirky because they just want to see what happens and, and they're sort of in watching mode. Uh, and then the zoners uh, are not necessarily people who are playing without skill, but when I play, like I alluded that I'm very good at hearts, I am, um, uh, I, but I'm no, longer, I'm no longer an innovator there. Uh, I can't innovate anything else. I've, I've played too many hours of it. There's nothing left for me to innovate. innovate. Or, or I'll be very excited when somebody shows me something to. Um, and, and the honings become too difficult for me. Uh, so when I'm playing, instead I'm exercising my skills, which is feels good to do. And, and I call that zoning out. And you get into sort of the flow. Flowers. Maybe I should call it flowers. That sounds a little... Flowers. <laughs> flowers. <laughs> nice. Yes. Um, all right. I, th I think that we're going to... I think we ran out of time. We're going we're gonna to end it there. Um, thank you so much, Richard Garfield. Amazing. <laughs> it was an honor. It was an honor to have you.